Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to start with verse 17, and we're continuing our sermons on the Sermon on the Mount, and this is sermon number 3, and this one's called The Law and Jesus. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Do not think I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one, one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. May God bless the reading of his word and let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray to your God that your, uh, that your word will rain fresh on us today, Lord, that you would just help us, Lord, that it will impact people's lives, Lord. And I just pray to your God that every one of us needs to hear a word today. And I just pray that you would just take all the distractions away from us right now so we can solely concentrate on you. And we thank you and love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about today is the law. What was the purpose of the law? When we talk about the Old Testament law in the Old Testament, and we get into these things, and we say, hey, does the Old Testament still apply to us today? You ever heard anybody ask that? Does the Old Testament law? You know, if we followed every Old Testament law, you wouldn't be able to eat at probably 99% of the restaurants in Savannah or Pooler, right? So we have to understand what that law means to us. So the purpose of the law is this. God's moral and ceremonial laws were given to help people to love God. How to love God? They were given to say, hey, we want you to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's what the laws are designed to do, is to help you to love on God. But over time, these laws have been misquoted, they've been misapplied, and they've been misinterpreted. Now, think about this. At the time of Jesus... The religious leaders, they had done turned the laws upside down. They had done taken them to another level. They were already told, they were already said, but they were taking them to another level. They were misquoting them. They were misapplying them to their lives and all these things. And all of a sudden, when Jesus come around, he was putting the Pharisees in their place, wasn't he? Now he was saying, wait a minute, let's get this straight. So here's the parts of the law. Let's just look at it real quick. The parts of the law is this. You got the purpose of the law which is to help us to love God, the parts of the law is this, the ceremonial law. The ceremonial, the ceremonial law related specifically to Israel's worship. Now, did you hear me? It didn't have to apply with us so much, but to Israel's worship. And then you also have, and anybody ever read through the book of Leviticus? I mean, y'all read the Bible, right? <laughs> the book of Leviticus is a... Anybody find it just like, man, I can't wait to read the book of Leviticus. Anybody feel like that? I don't know about you, but when I go to read the Leviticus, I do it just because it's in there and I know I need to read it. I'm like, oh, no, this is painful because it's all these laws and stuff and they have nothing to do with us and all this stuff. But it had to do with Israel's time, right? It, it was very important to them. And God's people, God's chosen people were the Israelites. So the ceremonial law related to, their, uh, to Israel's uh, worship. These laws pointed forward to Jesus Christ. But now that Jesus had come... These laws were no longer necessary after Jesus' death and resurrection. Hey, listen, the whole Bible, do you know who it points to? Jesus Christ. All these laws help people come to know the coming Messiah. Even though the Jews rejected him, this Jesus that was to come, that's what the Old Testament was pointing toward. So when Jesus finally came as the Messiah, the laws were no longer needed. Those ceremonial laws, right? And then you had... Not only the ceremonial law, but you had the civil law. This law had to deal with daily living in Israel. These laws only applied to Israel, right, at the time. So that was the civil laws. But then you had the last one is the moral law. The moral law. Now think about this one, such as the Ten Commandments. Are the Ten Commandments relevant today? I want you to think about this. Now I've played this before, and I'm afraid to play it in front of a crowd like this, but I have done this. I have asked people before, you could take just about every one, if not all, of every, every sin imaginable, and you can pull them back to the Ten Commandments. Do you realize that? The first four Ten Commandments deal with God. 
A lot of our sins deal against God, right? The last six of them deal with others. So with God and others, it almost carries a, in everything possible, you can point your point of sin back to the Ten Commandments. So is the Ten Commandments still relevant today? Absolutely. Did Jesus point out the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. Did he talk about them? Yes. Is the Ten Commandments relevant today? Absolutely. So the moral law, everything that the moral law was, it was still there. And it requires strict obedience. The moral law had to do with the heart. You know what? I had this a while ago. I couldn't make a heart because I'm not very creative. I got Miss Katie to do this. And uh, <laughs> she said she didn't like it. But anyway, I said, uh, went up to Heather earlier. And I said, Heather, and you said I didn't have a heart. She said, but it's Plato. <laughs> Sickening thing. Now, when you have a heart, though, everybody has a heart, but the heart is not, what does the heart do? It pumps blood to the body, right? All right, so this heart is very important. Whatever comes into your life is very important. Do you know that everything that comes into your life, it puts an impression on you? We think that it don't. We think this heart is more like, uh, I ain't going to make fun of nobody on that one. I was going to do it, but I won't. Let me see if I can get to a wall. We think that our heart is like this. What would happen if I throw a ball against that? It's going to do what? It's going to bounce right off of it. We think that our heart can bounce off things like that. We think that we can take in whatever we want in our life and it will just bounce right off. Right? But you know what? The heart is more impressionable than that. If, you, if I took, let's, talk, let's start talking. When you're born, you know, you're born with sin. Do you have to teach children how to do wrong? No, they're going to do wrong, ain't it? They're going to try to do the wrong thing every time. But what happens is when you get into your teenage years, you start being impressionable, don't you? So all of a sudden, when the first thing happens, what happens? Bam. That's the first one. Does that ever leave? Does that, that impression that, that you got when you were younger ever leave you? It's there, ain't it? It's there in your heart. Then when something else comes along, somebody offers you a first cigarette or something, and you do it, bam, there's another impression. Every time you do something, you watch a, a movie with the first cussing in and all in it, your first rated R movie, what does it do? Bam. It makes an impression. Everything that you do in life makes an impression. Everything that you watch on TV makes an impression. Everything that you listen to on the radio makes an impression. Everything that you... Um, listen to, watch, it, your friends that you hang around with, the dirty jokes that you listen to, impressions, 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 impressions. And you know what happens? Over time, you've got a heart full of impressions. And we're like, I wonder why I can't live for God. I wonder why I can't live for God. I wonder why I'm having a, such a struggle to do what God tells me to do. It's because we keep, instead of taking now and putting a different impression Instead of Jesus saying, hey, this is your new heart, no impressions, I can take it and do that for you if you want. But what happens is, instead of feeding unto the word of God, you know what we keep doing? We flip it back over and we start impressing it all over again. We start watching the same movies, we start listening to the same music, and guess what happens? You got your impression back again. That's what our heart looks like. And you wonder, you know, hey, how am I going to get better? How am I going to do better? You've got to stop doing the things you're doing. That's the way it is. You've got to change your life around. You've got to say, hey, God, Jesus gave me a new heart. I'm a new person. I'm a new creature. I can no longer do the things that I once did. And when I start doing those things again, guess what it's going to do? Now the heart is clean. You're going to start putting impressions on that. The heart is not made for that. It's made, guess what? It's like a sponge. It's going to absorb everything that you put into it. And it makes an impression. And then all of a sudden, you're stuck one day. You're stuck in habits one day. You're stuck in addictions one day. And you're like, man, why, how did this happen? From years of putting impressions on your heart. Now, how are you going to get rid of that? You've got to impress it with God. You've got to start putting different things into your life. You've got to stop watching the movies that you watch. You've got to stop listening to the music. You know what? And I can go all day on music. Y'all don't want me to go there, do you? We don't want to go to the country music. We don't want to go to the rock and roll music. We don't want to go to the rap and all that stuff because I can find something wrong in all of it, right? Does it leave an impression? You better believe it. you telling me that a country song talking about drinking and going out and partying? Uh, Alan Jackson, 5 o'clock somewhere. A lot of y'all probably know this song. Don't smile when I say it too much because be, you'll be guilty. But... 
Five o'clock somewhere, you think, oh, this is a good catchy song, you know. Oh, it's five o'clock somewhere, you know. Yeah, what he's talking about is five o'clock somewhere. What's that mean? Happy hour. Happy hour somewhere in the United States or in the world is five o'clock to where we can have happy hour, which means we can go get a drink. Does that make an impression on you? Absolutely. And we think that this world does not make an impression on us. Whatever we take into our life makes an impression on us. Now, so that's the first thing. We talk about the law. We talk about the moral law. We talk about the, the heart is impressionable and that everything leaves an imprint. Talked about the heart. Now I'm going to throw my heart down, all right? So some examples from the law of, uh, of Jesus of the law and the heart. Now think about this. Number one, he talks about intense anger. Matthew chapter 5, look at it with me, verse 21. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Let's stop right there. You have heard of old. Now all of a sudden, all of a, what happens? These religious leaders and everybody else at that time was like, hey, I never murdered anybody, so I'm good on that one. Check. I don't have no problem with that. That'd be nice. Most people in here, probably if you're sitting in here today, you probably never committed a murder. But if you did, you're forgiven for it, so we, we welcome you in. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> if you did that, right, if you did it, it says that you have heard of old that it was said that you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But here's what Jesus said. He says, but I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in the danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge to hand you over to the officer and be thrown in prison. Now, surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. We will go back to part of that verse probably next week. But right now, I want to key on this. There's something different. Maybe you have not committed murder in your life. But you know what the root of murder is? You know where murder comes from? It comes from anger. You know what? People are so prideful and so angry. Where does angry come from? There had to be an imprint of anger in the heart, right? Somewhere along the way, you got angry. Somewhere along the way, you've had disappointments. Somewhere along the way, you've had somebody make you mad. Somewhere along the way, you've had somebody hurt you. All this stuff leads up to it. And all of a sudden, you keep holding this stuff in, and you never let it go. You never ask Jesus to forgive you. Guess what's going to happen one day? You're going to explode. You're going to explode. And let me tell you something. God forbid the person that gets in the way of somebody that holds all that stuff in and explodes. Because you're going to hurt somebody. You're going to hurt somebody. You know why? All because that anger is just sitting there, that unforgiveness towards somebody, all that stuff just resides in your life, and it just keeps there, and it keeps festering up till one day it comes out. Now, I know I'm like this, okay? I'm one of those people that takes a lot to make me mad, you know, and I'm, I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but when you make me mad, I can get mad, all right? I can get angry, but it takes a whole lot to get me there, and, and the older I get, the closer I get to God, thank God that it goes away more and more, but let me tell you something. When you're angry, Listen, there's something that caused that, and it all happened when you were younger. All those impressions you made, all that unforgiveness, all those grudges that you hold. If you've got a grudge against somebody in the church, and this will come up more next week, so don't fall out. Don't, don't not come to church next Sunday if we talk about this. But if you've got a grudge with somebody, you need to clear it up because that's going to cause that anger in your life. A lady once come to Billy Sunday and tried to rationalize her anger outburst. He, she said, there's nothing wrong with losing my temper, she said. I blow up and then it's all over. He says, so does a shotgun and look at the damage it leaves behind. Right? If you don't get rid of that root cause, there's something that's making you angry. And you know what? Here's the point about it. Do you not think that every one of us in here, I know you think that, oh, I'm not capable of doing something like that. That's a lie. Do you know what every one of y'all is capable of murder? Do you believe that? I'm capable of it. 
Do something to one of my kids over and over again. Go over there and start hitting him with a baseball bat and see what I will do. I hope I don't. I hope I never see it. I hope I don't ever see it. But I'm capable of murder. You're capable of murder. I guarantee you. But that anger that subsides and it just keeps holding on and holding on, there's a root cause of that, ain't it? People just don't murder for the reason of it. They just don't go out one day and say, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to murder somebody today. <laughs> yep. I think I can pick it out. I'm going to look up. What if I said that? What if I just looked through the crowd right now and said, ah, I'm going to murder somebody today, and I'm just going to pick out somebody? You just don't do that, do you? It comes from that anger that's already within, right? Then the other one. So the first one is intense anger. Another example uh, that he uses is intimate relations. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. It says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. And you say, wait a minute, I'm a good person. I've never done that. I don't, that's, that's out of my uh, range. Then he says, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, let me tell you something. If it means that if you have a problem with lust, okay, don't cut out your eyes. <laughs> don't take that literally. Because <laughs> if you don't have your eyes, you can't see. <laughs> if you cut out a, up a hand, you can't do things, right? It doesn't mean that because here's what's happened. Even if you cut out your eyes, you can still lust. Do you realize that? You know why? Because it's where? It's in the heart. It's already made an impression. Let me tell you something. I'll talk to not many young people in here today, so I'm going to be very careful when I say these words. But when, um, when you're young, young men, men in here especially, when it comes to making that impression when you were younger, what's the first thing we're taught? You know, we're taught to watch these things. We're taught a different way of life. And you know what I'm talking about, so I'm not going to get into detail. And all of a sudden, that leaves an impression, watching certain things, looking at different magazines and all that stuff. Now it's all over the Internet. You don't think that stuff leaves an impression for the rest of your life? You see, it's there. There's three types of love in the Greek. One is agape love. If you've been in church, you know these. Agape love is sacrificial love. It's what Jesus done on the cross. It's giving his life up for somebody. That's agape love, the highest love that you can possibly have. Then there's a phileo love. Phileo is where we get the word Philadelphia, which is the city of... Brotherly love. It's a brotherly type love, right? Friendly type of love. Then all of a sudden you have this last one in the Greek. It's called an eros love. Eros in the Greek is where we get our English word erotic from. Do you know what? The problem with our, our marriages and things like that and everything else that goes on in our world today is because of eros love. It's all because the world teaches us eros love. It does not teach us agape love. Do you think that, that, that love is like this? Do you think that love is something that, you know what, when you say you fall in love, as you fall in love, you can fall out of love. That's not agape love. Agape love, that means that I'm going to see every fault that Michelle has, and I'm going to love her regardless of it. She's going to see every fault that I have. She's going to love me regardless of it. That's agape love. We would be willing to die for one another. That's agape love. But then you have this arrows love. The love that you see all of her signs, all the way. I, I used this example the other day, and uh, be careful how to use it here. But <laughs> when you're riding down 95, you used to could see all the way from the beginning of South Carolina, right? All the way on 95 from South Carolina, we saw signs. And it says, we bear all. Y'all remember those signs? Doesn't mean you're a heathen if you just saw the signs, so don't be afraid to take care. Yeah. They used to be all the way from South Carolina, all the way into Georgia, all the way till you get to a little town called Darien. Do you know what's in Darien? Absolutely nothing. Matter of fact, they tried to put an outlet mall there. Guess what? We went there, uh, what was it, during the summer? Everything's closed down just about. You know why? Because there's nothing in Darien. You know? It needs to have a barbecue pit. Leave it at that. <laughs> you don't need to have an outlet mall. You're not big enough for an outlet mall. But all of a sudden, all the way from 95 on South Carolina all the way to Georgia, that's all you've seen for miles and miles and miles. And you don't think the world teaches us and imprints that in our heart that, listen, it's okay. Eros love, erotic love. 
Intimate relations outside of marriage is not where it's at. That's not what the Bible says. It says that if you do any intimate relations outside of marriage, you notice I'm using that word, so if you're not smart enough to catch on to that, catch me afterwards, and I'll tell you what the real word is in adult terms. Intimate relations, all right? Any intimate relations outside of marriage is adultery. So when you say, I've never committed adultery, any intimate relationship, any lust in your heart, you know what? And there's probably not a person in this room that either still struggling with it or has struggled with it in their lifetime. Let's just be honest. Anger and lust are two things that we struggle with. Do you think there was a reason that Jesus pointed those out? Right? The third one. You got intimate relations and then you got ineffective promises. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. It says again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you wear, swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Ineffective promises. You know what is distrust is a result from that. You know what happens when people have to say, I promise? It says, I promise you that this is going to happen. Why do you feel like you always have to, I swear that this is, this is the truth. You know what? You need to be such a person of integrity, such a person of integrity, that when you say something, somebody's going to believe it. Do you hear me? That means when you say, I promise, don't even add that into your statement. When you say, I swear, don't a even add that into your statement. Because if you've got to add that into your statement, well, it's a habit out of most of us, I understand. But if you've got to add that into it, guess what the root of that is? The root is dishonesty. You know what? The imprint, the imprint of lies in the heart. Evidently, somewhere along the way, guess what? When you were younger, you knew how to lie. Anybody doesn't know how to lie? Did anybody have to teach you how to lie? Right? Think about it. Did you do your homework today? Has any parent ever heard that? You've done your homework today? Yes. Guess what? We got the internet today, and they send you emails. So-and-so did not complete their I mean, I, my goodness, we must get five of them a week. Man, so when you don't do your homework, guess what? They'll say, I did, I did my homework. You did? Why am I getting this email? <laughs> But I did my homework. See, you don't have to be taught how to lie, do you? You know how to lie. And all the way from a little child, you, it's been impressed. It's made an impression on your life, and now you have to make sure that people believe you. But I promise it's true. If it's true, then say it's true. Your integrity should speak for itself. You should never have to go and promise stuff like that. Your integrity should be so high that when you say something, they're going to believe it. How many people of you, and don't raise your hand, can people can come to you because they trust you? That's one thing that I know that I've got in my life. People trust me. And I tell those guys at work, I tell them, you might not like the way I run the program. You might not agree with the decisions I make. But there's one thing you will not question from me is my integrity. Because you can't take that away from me. And they know that they'll come and they'll sit right across from my office and they'll say stuff to me that they've never told anybody else before. You know why? Because there's a trust factor there. There's a trust factor. Do you have that kind of trust in your life? Do you have that kind of the where you don't have to say, I promise, I swear, or anything else? You see what happens? All this is because of, I done patted it down now. It don't look like a heart. looks like a pancake maybe, but <laughs> whatever. It's still a heart. Envision it. <laughs> so when you still understand this, guess what? It's all about the heart. You know, when Jesus said, I come to abolish the law. And these Pharisees, they were all up there, and they were like, hey, I don't murder. <laughs> I don't commit adultery. <laughs> I don't lie, you know. And all of a sudden, you got all these things that come in contact, and Jesus said, well, you have heard of old. But you know what Jesus doing? Jesus saying, now take a look deep down in your heart. You like to judge and point fingers? All of us like to do it at times. We like to judge and point fingers and judge other people. You like to judge and point fingers? Jesus is saying, you better look down in your heart. Because whereas you haven't committed murder, you've got anger. Whereas you haven't committed adultery, you've lusted. Whereas you don't think you've lied, 
And you say your promise, there's your integrity. It's all about the heart. Where's your heart at today? Has it been impressed by the world so much that you can't even hardly get it right? You know what you need? One thing I don't like is tradition. So when I say old-fashioned, don't, don't think it's tradition. But this is what it is, an old-fashioned altar. You need an old-fashioned altar to come down here. doesn't mean that you struggle with anger or lust or lies. It might be something else in your life that's already made that imprint on your life. You know what? During this invitation time, we do it at the beginning of the service, and you know some of you have already laid it, but if you've got to come back again, other people's got to come back, come down here and use this altar. Give it up to God. Make sure that those impressions, you know, that you don't keep putting them in there, right? Think about the music. Think about your TV. Think about all those things that are making our lives miserable because they're making an imprint on our lives and on our heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for today. Just pray to God that you would just help us, Lord, as we uh, heard your word today, Lord, and we've seen that these things are in our lives, Lord, and we see so much, Lord, that we have these things. I pray to God that you would just help us, Lord, to reach down deep and look inside. Open up our hearts and help us to look deep and understand that we have the same problems that everyone else has. Lord, if we say that we don't have these problems, Lord, we're lying. Lord, we're all human. We're all full of sin. And we've all had things from childhood that's made that impression on our lives. I pray to God that you would just help us today. Help us to understand that there is a Savior, a Messiah that these laws pointed to, and he's already came. The Jews may not believe it, or some of them do believe it, Lord, but there's many that don't. There's many people that don't believe it, outside of the Jewish race. But we know for a fact, Lord, that you come. You come and died on that cross for us, Lord. And all those things that's made an impression on our heart, Lord, you have forgiven us for them. But Heavenly Father, now we have to pour something else into our lives. We can't continue looking at the stuff that we looked at before on TV, on the movies. Can't keep listening to the same music, Lord, and expect our lives to be different. We can't expect to be hanging around the same places. Sometimes we need to change those. Maybe even the people we hang out with. Whatever it is, Lord, you help us, Lord, to make another impression on our heart. Something that's better. Something that's, oh, that we can be just joyous for that 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 is the jesus christ making that imprint heavenly father if there's any kind of tattoo i would want on my heart it's the letters jc jesus christ and i just pray to god that you would just help us lord to just understand that truth today help us lord to get rid of this filth out of our lives lord and help us to start living for you today And we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.